for all of us. It's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Today on the show, I've got Jeff Beisman. He's the Chief Marketing Officer at National Debt Relief. Jeff's been with NDR in the role since January 2021. He's responsible for all direct consumer marketing activities at the company, including PR, partnership development, paid search, social media, and CRM. On the show today, we talk about his pathway to becoming CMO at National Debt Relief and the many different industries he's actually worked in, from footwear to entertainment to banking to technology. We talk about what attracted to him to National Debt Relief and the purpose and the the actual really good work that they do to help people overcome their personal debt situations and hardships. We talk about what marketing looks like at National Debt Relief and the importance of layering your marketing from paid search and organic search to, to actually stimulate demand in the upper funnel with things that you would traditionally think of as broadcast TV and earned media and how all of that works together to drive demand stimulation, demand capture, and demand migration. That and much more with Jeff Beisman. Well, Jeff, welcome to the show. Thank you. It, it is a real honor. I'm a huge fan. I listen to your podcasts all the time and super glad to be here and glad we've been able to connect. Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to the conversation. I think before we get into the business side and career side, and maybe this is related, but tell me about your, your NFL dream career that you had. <laughs> Many moons ago. So I've always been a big, I grew up in Texas and the joke goes, there are two sports in Texas. There's football and spring football. So <laughs> anyway, I matriculated at the University of Texas at Austin, got a bachelor's and a master's and an MBA and was a graduate assistant. Somehow, some way I talked myself into that job for the, the, the football team and worked for the recruiting coordinator at the time. And one of my duties was to facilitate the NFL scouts that would come to look at our players and watch film and everything like that. And I had this fantasy about I want to be an NFL GM or a player personnel director or something like that and chase that dream for all of a minute. And along the way, I talked to a lot of coaches and former coaches. And I had somebody at one point even say to me, you should really separate your hobbies from your <laughs> vocational opportunities. But it was fascinating to me. I absolutely loved learning from them and decided to pursue marketing shortly after uh, realizing it probably wasn't the right career path for me. <laughs> I love that. I love yeah. That. And I really like that advice. Like I have this dream one day, like if I were ever born again or something, being in the entertainment business, and I don't know if it'd be like showrunner, producer, I don't know. I could, I get excited about even thinking about it even now. <laughs> but yeah. There's, you know, I, it's all about connections and relationships. And I have none <laughs> so, in that space. So. Yeah. And I worked it as well as you could at the time. This was pre-internet. And I remember just typing out letters and talking to everybody and networking and making connections. And there were absolutely opportunities, but I thought that my business acumen was going to maybe carry me a little further than what I might be able to do working for an NFL team or a college team. From from those days to where you are now, you're the uh, chief marketing officer at National Debt Relief. What was the career path on the business side? It's funny. It looks like a circuitous route. But when I started my career as a marketer, I tried to take some purposeful steps. So if you look at, I've, <laughs> I joke, if you name a vertical, I probably have worked in it, consulted to it, or have some knowledge of it. And so early on in my career, I, I was a product marketer. And a lot of people, when they hear product today, they think software and engineering, but it was literally CPG style product marketing work. 
in the footwear and apparel industry and even during my time at, at Disney. But I picked up those core skills that I think are really important to marketers outside of the P called promotion pricing and things like that and running a PL. And that was really a purposeful endeavor to get that skill set. Uh, I spent time after that getting into the digital world. And I actually worked at after Disney at Sony Pictures in their digital division. We were chasing what Netflix became well ahead of its time. I spent a bunch of years there, learned the entertainment space and really started to fall in love with performance marketing. And my next choice may not have sounded very obvious, but I went to work in the financial services space, which is ironically where I am back today. Heavy investments, heavy on the analytics, heavy on understanding the numbers and performance in a very disciplined vertical. And so I was able to parlay some of those skills in terms of brand, storytelling, understanding how to market and position a product with more of the core performance marketing skills that you see really that have taken shape today with this whole new wave of very bright young marketers that, that, that kind of get that. Spent a lot of time in, in other places. Worked. It's really interesting. I worked for some big companies early on. And after leaving financial services, which was Bank of America in 2012, I believe, I went to venture-backed startups. And I started at a Series C which was shoot Azzle and worked my way down to, I think, a Series A and even a bootstrap. So I got that experience of working in these small companies where you're on a lifeboat and everybody has to row the oars in the same direction or the boat sinks. So those were incredible skills and knowledge that I picked up. I spent some time working for AT&T in their B2B business, which was the, which was YP. And so I learned that that space and I'll complete the story by saying the national debt relief opportunity popped up back in 2020. And it was just a perfect fit. It was a culmination of, I think, all of the skill set and experience I developed. And I just couldn't say no to the opportunity. So it's been a great three and a half year run being here. I love it. And tell me a little bit. I know that national debt relief is very different than like many of the brands you mentioned from footwear to like Disney and Sony and B of A and AT&T. What was it that stood out to you about national debt relief and what the business was trying to do? Yeah. So from a marketer to marketer, I think you probably feel the same way. When I have alignment of my heart in my mind, I'm at my best. And We may have worked places before where you are marketing and selling something that maybe the consumer doesn't need it (laughs) or doesn't need it as much. And I find that I'm at my best when I really believe in a company mission and my personal values line up with what we're trying to do. And that's not to say that wasn't happening in other places I've been, but What national debt relief does for the consumer is absolutely incredible. And so when people say we're really helping people and they're talking about their company and their job, I can truly say that with conviction and mean it. So there's never any cognitive dissonance or check your morals in your drawer and go to work every day. I get up and I just truly believe in the mission of the company. And that's what really led me here was this gem of a company that's doing great things for consumers that really need the help. That's awesome. I love it when those two things align to your point. Like it's, it, it is when I think most people are at their best, not just maybe you and me. <laughs> so it's awesome you found that opportunity. I know, I think before we can talk about national debt relief and company's role, we have to talk a, a little bit about consumer debt and like where, help me understand where we are today in the consumer debt world, if you will. Yeah. The, con- the American consumer right now, the Main Street consumer is not in a good place coming out of COVID. And you could see this coming a little bit with what happened during COVID. 
there was a lot of forbearance and forgiveness and a lot of money that was circulated into the economy. And as a result of that, first of all, that money is largely gone. What we're seeing today is consumer household savings rates are at record lows. And during COVID, they were at record highs. Core inflation is extremely high. I think everybody knows that's stating the obvious. And the other obvious is, is interest rates. And Powell came out recently and basically said he's holding the line. He's got a cool inflation. But the American consumer is largely living hand to mouth right now. And they're really struggling. So if you think about it, everything is more costly than it used to be. And the cost to service your debt is extremely high. So what's happening right now is you're seeing, we're seeing record breaking total revolving debt numbers. I think the most recent data that came out of the Q4 of 2023 was about 1.1 trillion. And that was about 50 billion bigger than the uh, previous quarter. So we don't have the first quarter of 24 numbers, but it's probably going to jump again. And so you have a lot of people out there that are struggling. They're having to put core needs like food and utilities and things like that on their credit cards against their existing balances at super high interest rates. And they can ill afford just one small unexpected expense coming at them. So the American consumer is in a really tough spot right now, and I feel for them, and I'm super glad we're there to help them right now. Yeah, let's talk about that. Let's, what is like National Debt Relief's role in helping people address their debt and, and achieve debt relief? If you will. Yeah, so first of all, it's really interesting. It's a concept that's been around for 20-something years but, and we'll talk about this later, perhaps, awareness of debt relief or debt settlement or debt resolution, whatever you want to call it, is still pretty darn low for the American consumer. It's different than a loan. So the most obvious choice that American consumers make if they've got debt challenges is to do a personal loan, a debt consolidation loan of some kind. But at today's interest rates, it just may be untenable, or they may not be able to get that kind of credit. There are other options like bankruptcy, which is what I usually like to call a last resort. And then there are other things as well, but debt relief or debt settlement is different than uh, a loan. It's different than a bankruptcy. So effectively, what national debt relief acts as is an agent for the consumer. When you enroll in our program, we understand how much revolving debt you have. Most of its credit cards could be medical bills or legal and some other things like that. We put you on a budget and we put you into a program payment with us and do basically an escrow account that you own. It's usually less than what your debt service is. And then as we accumulate funds in that account, we will work with your creditors to negotiate down the total amount that you owe. And so the savings for the consumer is very desirable. There's a couple of reasons why it makes sense. One is usually before fees, it's close to 50% savings on, on the debt. It depends on your situation. Don't take that in and, and run with it. But it's very favorable. And generally speaking, if you stick to the program, you do what you're supposed to do, you're usually out of debt and in a much better place in 24 to 48 months. So a lot of other options like a loan is usually a longer term than that. So the value is really that we DIY it. Uh, or we, we do it for you, rather. It's not a DIY program. So we take over. You've immediately got a team on your side that's got your back and is negotiating directly with your creditors to get you the best settlement offer possible. And then it's up to the consumer or one of our clients that's enrolled in the program to approve those settlement offers. We'll pay off their debt. 
and we'll move on to the next creditor that they may have some outstanding uh, balances with. So that's generally how it works for the consumer. And behaviorally, they're changed people, which is a remarkable thing. So it's not just that they've gotten out of debt, they're almost invariably more responsible with their credit more able to manage it and in a much better place when they graduate from the program. Yeah, no, it makes sense. I mean, you've got like a a coupling of like kind of um, money management skills or budgeting and forced behavior change to get them to a better place, but also gives you the ability to renegotiate their, their debt on the other end for them. Yeah. I, I know when we last spoke, like this isn't just for everyone. Like you, you have to qualify to, to be a customer, right? Is that, do I have that right? You do. So there are technical aspects of qualifying. It's really not with a loan product as an example. You've got to qualify with your credit score and some other things. So none of that. It's the types of debt. So obviously, it's going to be unsecured debt, not like a mortgage, something that's collateralized. It's, it can't be like a government student loan. It could be a private student loan. Um, but most importantly, you have to have a genuine hardship. And so that to me is another reason why I get up and go to work every single day. We don't take people into the program that did something like they took out a not picking on Chase. So it could be any, any bank, any card, right? Yeah. They get issued a credit card with a thirty thousand dollar line, and they go to Tahiti and run it up, and then call us. That's not a hardship. A hardship might be a medical issue. It could be uh, income reduction. It could be uh, a divorce. Right? All kinds of things. And what we hear every single day is these heartbreaking stories about people that. They're trying to live responsible and make it. And then something happens and they're just in a bad spot. And those are the people that we allow into the program. And believe it or not, they're not exceptions. They're a lot of most of American consumers. And so that gives us leverage and negotiating power when we're talking to a creditor. In other words, this is a good person that has a genuine hardship and we'll demonstrate that to them. Yeah, no, I, I, it makes so so much sense. And you're right. Most people in the U.S., I think, I can't remember the stat and I won't, I'll murder it if I try to repeat it. But essentially, we were like one big bill away on average from experiencing exactly what you just talked about. So it could be a trip to the emergency room and a a hospital stay or an illness or something of that or losing a job or something of that nature that could spiral into a situation where there's really no, no way out without the types of services that you guys are helping people with. That's exactly right. That's pretty amazing. I can totally... I totally get why this gets you up in the morning because you're helping people that are just down on their luck, largely. They've experienced some sort of hardship and they need the help. Yeah, Uh, I'll tell you. chills. Yeah, I'll tell you a quickie. We, if you look at our TV campaigns today and you see this showing up in a lot of other places, we have a campaign called Real Human Stories and it's basically the story arc of somebody that is pre-debt then gets themselves into debt and finds NDR and enrolls and graduates our program. And so we actually invite our clients to tell those stories. And so we've done this numerous times. And so I'm at all of these shoots and I get to talk to them. And I had a woman who's actually in our TV spots hug me and start crying and saying, thank you so much. You like saved my life. And I'm like, I'm just the marketing guy, right? (laughs) But it's unbelievable. I've never seen anything like it where people are literally brought to tears and joyful with what you do. So going back to why do I get up and go to work? (laughs) That's a good reason. Yeah, 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 yeah. And no offense to football, but much better than football. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Well, I know we la- when we last ha- talked, you you said something that was counterintuitive to me at first, and 
you said, we don't want repeat customers, which does sound like you're putting yourself out of business. And I, it makes sense if you think hard enough about it, but like, how do I, like, how do you reconcile that? Like, how do you, how, how do you make a business? <laughs> yeah, it seems quite antithetical. And I've worked in LTV subscription models before, and you're obviously trying to get a recurrence of purchase, right? It's just, how, that's how the numbers work. And so I'm very familiar with that. But effectively, if we get a repeat client in our program, we failed. Because the idea is that this is a life changing experience. And like I said earlier, when you look at what we see in the data, people come out the other side, and they're just different. And so there's two things, right? They get it from a like financial perspective. But if you really think about and you go back to what happens to somebody when they do get into debt, it's not really a financial crisis. It's an emotional crisis. It affects you physically, emotionally, and mentally. And you are literally reduced to being defined just by that debt. You withdraw, you have a higher likelihood of divorcing or leaving your partner, anxiety, stress, all those things are just like your cortisol levels are through the roof. So when you have somebody come out the other side and they've learned how to responsibly use credit, they know how to live within a budget because of all that behavioral training, and they've had the experience of being at that low point of being in debt, generally speaking, you're not going to let that happen again. And if it does, I just look at it as that's a failure on our part. So we don't want to see anybody again. And we have a healthy business because quite frankly, it's in our mission that effectively make sure that there isn't debt in our society. But this is a this is a society that lives on credit. And while I wish it wasn't the case, and I wish so many people weren't struggling, there are still millions and millions of people out there that don't even really get how it works. And so we try our best to explain it to people and help them if they need our help. But there's still that lack of financial education, and even discipline in handling your credit responsibly. So there's a large addressable market, even if our whole goal is to not see you again. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's definitely a systemic, lar- systemically large <laughs> market to go fishing in for sure. I'm glad you guys exist because it, it's the service you're providing is a quite transformational as we've talked about. So as a marketer, what does marketing look like on behalf of national debt relief? It feels like there's quite a bit of education that probably has to happen, but also I just would love to know how marketing in general looks like. Yeah, it, it's, I like to think it's a good marriage of building awareness and education, as you mentioned, along with good old performance marketing tactics and other things that we try to do to get the word out there and meet the consumer wherever they might be. And I'll go back to a point I made. So when I joined the company, uh, I was familiar in concept with what debt relief or debt settlement was and how it differed. But my gut was like, I don't think the American consumer really even understands that this exists. And so we started to do the typical brand and category awareness and health tracker stuff. And when the first set of data came back at a category level, unaided and even aided awareness was lower than I thought. And I'm like, we got a problem. (laughs) People don't know what this is. And even if they do, they can't really explain it. And so if you look at what we try to do today, it's a combination of demand stimulation in the market, coupled with demand capture and even working with partners, which is demand migration in a very diverse mix of media and marketing programs. Because in my professional opinion, they work way better together than if you're, let's say, only doing paid search, which is just classic demand capture. 
So we, we bring all those things together in a holistic, I hate the word omni-channel, by the way, or multi-channel, but we bring it all together in a synergistic way. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. And so you've been, you've been in like the performance marketing space a long time, whether it's performance marketing or more broadly, what do you think is critical for CMOs to be thinking about as you're thinking about like demand simulation and demand capture and then the demand migration that you guys are doing? I think the big epiphany for me is if you're solely focused on stuff like demand capture, so paid and organic search, you're really not making your market and you're basically relying on your ability to capture as much of the available demand that may be there, whether it's particular to your brand, which is another thing, or just more broadly. But as markets ebb and flow, as TAMs expand or shrink, you're, if that's all you're doing, you're really subject to those whims of the market. If you're coupling that with a healthy demand stimulation program, and I'm just going to speak in plain English, I know a lot of the audience probably gets it, broadcast media, earn media, things like that that are planting seeds, building awareness, getting your brand out there. And that's hooked up appropriately to your demand capture and your other things. You now can make your slice of the market bigger, even if it's shrinking. So I like to think of it like you control your own destiny. And so that's really what we've tried to put together. And the other thing about it is diversification is really important. I always go into panic mode when your mix is highly reliant on one media platform, one channel, something or other, because generally speaking, we know who the big digital media platforms are that are out there. And now you have put all your eggs into their basket. And if they move the cheese on you, you're in bad shape. So we never try to do that. We always try to make sure we have a healthy, diversified mix. And we're not solely reliant on one thing to drive uh, business value. Yeah. I mean, you, you found, <laughs> we're talking about finance and managing your finances at the root of what we're talking about. And you sound like a financial planner with your marketing <laughs> mix. Oh man, I can promise you I would, I would fail at that. But, but yeah, that's how we look at it. And today, I think with so much focus on performance and so many eyes from your finance partners on marketing, it is like that. I think that's a really good corollary. Yeah, yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense too. And I love what you talked about. If you're, you know, only focused on paid search and organic search, you're only, you're not making the market, right? Like you're not ebbing and flowing and trying to grow the pie or the, the market available to you at any given moment. So you're, you're controlling your destiny by pulling all the levers you, you have, or at least having the levers available to you when you need to pull them. Absolutely. Um, so that's awesome. That's awesome. It's been fun talking about national debt relief and the mission and the, the purpose that you guys serve with all your customers. I literally did get chills when we were talking about it. I got to go watch some videos. Oh, man. <laughs> get love my, it. Get my fix. But one of the things we love to do is get to know you a little bit more about who you are and what kind of motivates you. And my favorite question to ask everybody that comes on the show is what experience of your past defines or makes up who you are today? Man, there, there's a ton. I'd say. Probably the top experience in my past is it's almost like heuristics and learning over a long period of time. And it's just like one of those golden rules that my dad always told me. And I'm sure like everybody, you were like, yeah, sure. But if you look at really successful entrepreneurs that have built great businesses, they've got one major attribute almost always and that is to keep going when others fail and to not stop and to never give up so it's that grit it's that determination it's you need to get some data out of the database and nobody can do it i'm going to teach myself sql and, and i've looked at that and i'm like 
man, just the ability to never give up, as simple as it sounds, is one of the things that's really defined me as I've matured in my career. Yeah. No, I, I really like that. And something that something I've been thinking about along those lines is the the notion that you know, as you get into larger organizations and people that may not have experienced that, like entrepreneurship drive, the getting through all obstacles at all costs, like uh, many of our companies are organized in a way that like you have to be super entrepreneurial to get something through a massive organization. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, like just the number of steps, the stakeholders, the potential roadblocks. And I think it's really one of the most probably underrated components of like just a good, good skill to have in any environment, whether you're an entrepreneur or whether you're a corporate citizen. Anyway, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. My, my build on what you put out there. It's, and I, I work with a lot of different folks and across many different organizations. And it's one of the things that's the, frankly, a little hard to find some days to find those people that have that just fire in their belly to try to go accomplish something, take the hill, whatever it is. So anyway, yeah, I could go I, on, but I couldn't agree with you more. What advice would you give your younger self if you're starting this journey all over again? Number one thing would be patience. And the reason why is I don't think it's just the more recent crops and generations of people entering the business world, I think it's been there a while, maybe a little bit more today. Everybody's, I just got here. Where's my promotion? Where's my money? I expect to get from whatever manager to director to VP or something like that in a year. And if I don't, I'm going to leave and I'm going to go somewhere where that's my next title or my next compensation level. And what I've seen when I look back is if you're patient and you run your own race and you do good work, some of those other people that have the attributes or the traits that I mentioned before of just wanting to jump, you're the person that's left and all of a sudden that opportunity opens up for you. And I've seen that like numerous times. It's you go on to the next thing and somebody that was a manager, all of a sudden you look at their LinkedIn profile and now they're a VP running the, an entire kind of a division or operation. And they just stuck with it through the hard times. Because at the moment, you're just like thinking in that moment about, oh my gosh, this isn't going as well as I thought or whatever. Dealing with that adversity, sticking through it, usually pays off. I love that. I love that notion. Is there a topic you think marketers need to be learning more about or maybe something you're trying to learn more about yourself? The thing that I'm not going to talk about generative AI or <laughs> advanced analytics, or we could talk a little bit about that, but those are covered. The one thing that I've really become fascinated with is the practice of neuromarketing, which is, I don't know if you've seen the Simon Sinek TED Talk, start with the why, because he gets into it and you go way deeper. But at one point he says, it's not psychology, it's biology. And really understanding the fascinating structure of the human brain drives consumer behavior and response. And it's been codified into somewhat of a science today. And so I've really gotten into that lately and have found that it just feels logical. And when you go back and you look at what seemed to be elusive in the past, which is what's generally the most elusive thing that you do as a marketer, it's your creative. It's your message in the marketplace. It's how you tell your story. And it's got some science behind it. It's become a little more codified. And I look back and I'm like, oh, that makes sense why that worked or why that didn't work. And so that's my little nerdy endeavor is understanding more about that. Yeah, no, I think that's wise. I think that's wise. Cool. Um, two more questions for you. Are there any trends or subcultures that you're following you think other people should take notice of? 
I think that's probably the top one. And like I said, I'm not going to talk on AI or any anything like that, because I, again, I think you probably had guests on the show that have covered those topics. But that's probably the top one going cookie less meta and Google really dominating however, per, what percentage of eyeballs <laughs> there are on the internet today. Those are all curiosities and concerns of mine. And I don't know if you even want to call them trends, but probably those are the areas. And then lastly, I think is just ensuring that from a team structure perspective, you're always reinventing yourself and you're always looking at the most contemporary model to get results. And so that's the last thing, which is as a marketer, if you're a CMO or a VP or a director and you've got a group, it's not a set it and forget it. And the structure that you built may have served you two, three years ago, but you may be getting outmodeled today by something else that's emerging. So I'm always trying to pay attention to that. Last question for you. What do you think is the largest opportunity or threat facing marketers? <laughs> getting automated out of a job. <laughs> I guess we are going to talk about AI for a brief moment. I'm half kidding, but I was a Ray Kurzweil fan back 20 something years ago when he wrote The Singularity and was like basically antithetical to Moore's law around around computing technology and things like that. And it's all true today. So you're just seeing these exponential leaps in artificial intelligence and machine learning. And where is it going? And what am I doing versus what is it doing? is probably, I wouldn't call it a threat. It's just, we're in the midst of another revolution. The industrial and other, we're, we're in the midst of one right now. And your ability to adapt and reinvent yourself is important. And so that, I don't know if it's a threat or not, it's probably both. But that is probably the thing that I'm paying the most attention to. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I agree with you. It's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see how everything takes shape. It, in some cases, it's going super fast. And in other ways, it's, we're still trying to figure it out. <laughs> so it's a mixed bag, but I agree with you. It's a, if you're not paying attention, it could be very dangerous. <laughs> Absolutely. And my, I feel for our kids, next generations, because they got a lot of things to solve for, <laughs> whether it's what's the role of artificial intelligence that probably will become self-aware at some point, or uh, I don't want to politicize this conversation, but climate change and all of that stuff. And it's going to be, it's going to be a, it's going to be a challenge, but what do they say? Innovation or this, the, the necessity is the motherhood or whatever it is about the motherhood of invention. Human ingenuity will likely reconcile all this stuff and I'll probably be off the grid, off the internet at that point. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, probably. Me too. <laughs> yeah. But, but, but yeah, no, I, I think I think humans, if one thing has proven us true is I think over if you don't get too political about it, but you just look over the course of history is like our ability to innovate as a species is pretty phenomenal and I'm hopeful and optimistic that to your point like we will we'll figure it out like we will figure it out we now time is of the essence but we will figure it out um, yeah absolutely hopeful. and if you're not paying attention to your point you're just seeing these seismic shifts before your very eyes so we will have to yeah exactly exactly Jeff thank you so much for coming on the show it's been a great conversation yes thank you thank you so much it's been an absolute pleasure, Alan. Like I said, I'm a big fan and I'm looking forward to listening to many more of your guests and happy to come back anytime if you want to chop up something else. I love it. Yes, yes. Always welcome. Talk Thank to you soon. You. Thank you. Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me with post-production support from Sam Robertson. If you're new to Marketing Today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe on marketingtodaypodcast.com. Tell your friends and colleagues about the show. I love hearing from listeners. You can contact me at marketingtodaypodcast.com. 
There you'll also find complete show notes and links to what was discussed in the episode today, and you can search our archives. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing.